So to start our discussion of cameras, we probably should start by discussing eyes and the way that the parts of your eye relate to the parts of a camera. Uh, there's a very similar process going on in each. So here's your eyeball. Eyeball is light, uh, fast. Nothing can get in, no light can get into your eye except through your iris and your pupil in the front. So basically your iris is a muscle that's got a hole in the middle of it called your pupil. And that muscle can contract and expand and basically change the size of your pupil, which lets more or less light into your eye. So in the dark, it opens up wide and your pupil gets really big and lets more light in. And it's very bright time outside. If you're on the beach, it gets small, so not as much light comes in. That light goes through a lens and onto your retina. So if we're looking at an apple, light bounces off that apple, goes through the iris, through the lens, is projected onto the retina. Now that image actually arrives on your retina upside down. And basically your brain has to flip it upside down um, again to make it right side up. And that's something that happens kind of naturally that we don't even think about, um, but it's uh, an interesting fact about your eye that there's a, a large part of seeing actually doesn't happen in the eye, it happens in the brain after that image gets projected onto the retina. So camera is almost exactly the same setup. So you've got some sort of box, which is your camera, which is also light fast. So no light can come in except through um, this aperture here. You've also got a lens and you've also got a place like the retina where that image is recorded. And usually it's a sensor of some sort in a digital camera. But you have an aperture or an iris inside which is made up of little overlapping pieces of metal that are arranged in a circle and they can open or close sort of like your iris in your eye to let more or less light into your camera. So just like your iris. So basically if you're photographing an apple the light bounces off that apple goes through the aperture through the lens onto your sensor and again just like your eye it arrives upside down. So that's basically how eyes work and how cameras work. It's way more complicated. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But again, this is the crash course. Now we're going to talk about focal length a little bit. Focal length is a pretty straightforward concept to get your head around. So basically, focal length is simply a measurement of the distance between the lens and the image plane, which in this case could be a sensor and a digital camera or a film. But that distance is typically measured in millimeters because it's usually not a huge distance. Um, and so this is a relatively um, short focal length that I've drawn here. And so if we've got our favorite subject for photography, apparently an apple, and as the light enters into the camera through the lens and onto the sensor, you get an image from this focal length that might look like this. So here's our apple, upside down, of course, in frame. And so I'll actually here, I'll draw the, this is the actual frame of the film that's being recorded. And that's about how large that apple would appear with this focal length. Below here, we've got a different focal length that's much longer focal length. So again, a greater distance between the lens and the sensor which would also be measured in millimeters. And to show you the difference here, so with this longer focal length, this is more of what the image of the apple would look like on the same size sensor. So it's much bigger. So basically, focal length uh, measures, you can think of it, an easy way to think of it is a measure of magnification. So a longer focal length will give you more magnification. And a shorter focal length will give you less magnification. It will actually show you more of the scene that's in front of the camera. Okay, so I went and did a little experiment to show you how focal length works by shooting a couple of photographs in a neighborhood nearby. I set my camera up on a tripod and set the lens so that it was 24 millimeters, which is a wide angle lens. It's a short focal length. So you can see a lot um, of the street that's in front of my camera in this shot. And then without moving my camera, I switched the lens to a 60 millimeter, which is the longer focal length. And the longer focal length basically magnifies the scene that I'm seeing through my camera. So what I've got here is same view, but magnified. So I can't see as much of the street, but the street that I see at the end um, is in much more detail. So here's with the short focal length and here's with the long. But if it is simply magnification, then in theory, I should be able to take these two photos, take the photo I shot with the short focal length and 
magnify it, and I use Photoshop in this case, um, and basically just blow it up so that the area in the center that's about the same size as the photo I took with a long lens so that they're the same size, I should be able to take that photo and put it here and it should match up perfectly if all we've done is magnify the scene. And in fact, it fits perfectly. There's a little difference in um, exposure. You can see it's a little darker and there's a little bit more detail, but if I toggle back and forth, you can see it matches up exactly. So basically, things to keep in mind are longer focal length means more magnification and uh, basically a narrower field of view and a short focal length or a wide angle lens shows you more and has less magnification. And just for an example here, so this is a wide angle lens. So you can see it's not very, it's, it's fairly short the distance between that lens and the sensor inside the camera. Uh, it's larger, you can see the circumference is larger than a normal lens would be, and that's a way to get, uh, to compensate for the fact that you can't, you know, at, at some point you reach a point where the um, focal length is so short that you might be touching the sensor, there's only, you know, so far you can go. By using a physically larger in diameter lens, you can actually increase the uh, focal length, or excuse me, decrease the focal length farther than you normally would be able to. Now on the other end of the spectrum, here are two lenses with very long focal lengths. We call these telephoto lenses. Um, these are crazy long. This is probably, you, you, you'll notice that, that they're being supported by the lens rather than the camera. So the tripod is actually holding onto the lens because the lens weighs way more than the camera does. Um, but you can imagine the huge amount of magnification you would get from that telephoto lens. So that's the basic explanation of focal length with its relationship of long focal length means high magnification, short focal length means less magnification, and basically the longer your focal length, the less of your scene you can see, but the closer up it will appear to be.
Hello, Jedediah. Hello, Charlie. I didn't know we were speaking. Sure we're speaking, Jedediah. You're fired. Outside line, please. Yes. Knowing Thank the you. position that we have reached tonight is held to be not a fact. And that the public committee has been presented with a staff of resolutions intended to divert attention from grave national issues that need to be discussed. I have been urged to call expression to the task. I please, Mr. Dahlberg? Yes. Kenneth Dahlberg? Yes. This is Bob Woodward of the Washington yes. Post. Yes. About that $25,000 check deposited in the bank account of one of the Watergate burglars, Mr. Bernard Barker? As you know, sir, the check has your name on it. We were doing a story on this, and I was wondering if you...
So I've got a way that I can show you the kind of what exposure does to your image um, in Photoshop. This is a, uh, a file that I downloaded from ILM. They have a, an image format called OpenEXR, which is a um, high, dy high dynamic range file format, um, which we won't get into. But one of the things it lets you do is actually play with the exposure of a photograph um, after you've taken it. Um, it's way more complicated than that, but what it lets us do is look at what happens when you change the exposure um, using that combination of shutter speed and aperture size. So this is kind of a neutral exposure for this scene, and you can see it's got um, large areas that are in shadow and large areas in um, the distance that are in bright sunlight. And so you've got two different places where you could um, change your exposure to get more information onto your sensor. So let's start by underexposing it. So less light for a shorter period of time on the sensor. And so we'll drag this down and you can see the first thing that starts happening is this area in the background um, that was kind of blown out and too bright is now starting to show a huge amount of detail um, in the background there by the water. In the foreground though, where we had been able to see some things in the shadow, now we see nothing. It's just black. Um, there isn't enough light coming onto the sensor for long enough to capture the data about what's in those shadows. Now, if we this is called underexposing. If we go the other direction and overexpose, you can see the opposite is happening. Now we've got all sorts of really great detail in the shadow areas in the foreground, but there's nothing left of the bright areas uh, because they've been overexposed. And sometimes, as I just mentioned, we call that being blown out. Um, you can't see any detail because it's t too much. It's overexposed. Um, as a general rule, it's better to overexpose rather than to underexpose because you actually are capturing information about what's in those blown out areas because light is hitting your sensor. Whereas you underexpose, you can never get that detail back because that light never made it um, bouncing off of the objects that you're photographing onto the sensor in any way. So uh, exposure is often a trade-off between uh, exposing for bright areas and exposing for dark areas. And we'll look at an example of that right now from some films. He acted kind of funny sometimes, you know? No, I didn't. Yes, he did crazy things sometimes. I've been working for him 11 years now, in charge of the whole place. So I ought to know. Rosebud. Yes? Well, like I tell you, the old man acted kind of funny sometimes, but... Uh, I know how to handle him. A lot of service? Mm, yeah, but I know how to handle him. Like the time his wife... He acted kind of funny sometimes, you know? No, I didn't. Yes, he did crazy things sometimes. I've been working for him 11 years now, in charge of the whole place. So I ought to know. Rose. Who exactly are you? Name's Rango. <gasps> what is this? That there's Rango. Can't afraid of none of you. Is that right? Who exactly are you? Name's Rango. <gasps>
So aspect ratio is the way that we describe the shape of films. So different films are different shapes. They're all rectangles, but they're different types of rectangles. So aspect ratio is a way that we can um, easily identify and describe the particular shape um, of any given movie. So let's instead of using movies to start with, let's actually look at a painting. Um, this is Guernica by Picasso. And the nice thing about Guernica is I know what its actual dimensions are, and so I can use those dimensions to figure out its aspect ratio. So the one thing you need to know about aspect ratio in film is um, it's always described with the vertical measurement always being 1. 
So um, the horizontal then is calculated so that you know what the size of this horizontal measurement is in relationship to the, the vertical being one. So in this case, Guernica's horizontal is 2.22 times wider than it is high. So the aspect ratio for Guernica is 2.22 to 1. And that's how we would describe it. So for films, um, we'll talk about not all of the different aspect ratios or how they're made, but just the main ones. And probably the most important one um, is the first one that we had for film, which was 133 to 1. Sometimes we use a shorthand in describing aspect ratio, and we would just call this 133. Remember, it's always uh, measured against 1, which is always the height. So 133, uh, sometimes called academy ratio, this is the ratio that every film from the beginning of cinema to about the mid-50s, every film made was 133, and quite a few after the mid-50s continued to be made at 133. This was, though, the only aspect ratio that filmmakers had to choose from uh, for the first 50 or so years of uh, cinema. So you can see there's quite a variety of different movies here, just in this handful that I've pulled um, stills from, that are all 133. Regardless of who's in them, who directed them, what they're about, what kind of movie, they all had to fit into this 133 box. And filmmakers did a remarkable job uh, of making um, great movies that fit in this box. Uh, in the 50s, other techniques were developed to give us um, different aspect ratios. 185 or 185 to 1 is um, continues to be the most popular aspect ratio in film and you can see here's some examples of some 185 movies you can see it's a little bit wider than 133 uh, and definitely it's starting to look more cinematic to us um, in kind of modern times and again this is the one that we see the most often and then the third one we'll talk about is 235 to 1 or 235 and 235 is kind of a widescreen format and here are some movies that use one uh, two three five and you can see that it's much more horizontal and lends itself um, to uh, wide open spaces horizontal things big long spaceships etc so two three five is kind of the, the widest uh, popularly used aspect ratio so one three three one eight five 235, these are the most popular aspect ratios. Um, there is another one that you probably should know about, which is um, between 133 and 185, which is the newest one, which is 177 to 1, and that's the HDTV aspect ratio. And you can see it's just a little bit smaller than 185. To confuse things, though, of course, um, 133 and 177 have other names. Um, especially when you're talking about TVs and monitors. Uh, 133 is also called 4x3, and 177 is also called 16x9. You're probably most familiar with those terms. Um, and those are definitely uh, m most used for television and for um, computers, but uh, not so much for theatrical. Um, it, most movies that you'll watch on your TV... Um, uh, may be shown in 177, but they were probably filmed in 185 or 235. So that's the basic basics of aspect ratio.
You know something, cousin? I really don't believe you. for this. Truman. Dale Cooper, FBI. Pleasure. Good to meet you. <clears throat> Got any trouble finding the place? No, no. That's been fine. I came out over Highway 2 uh, near Lewis Fork. I stopped at a little place called the Lamplighter Inn. Had a slice of cherry pie. Incredible. Well, I'll tell you, we're sure glad to have the FBI here. Kind of lucky in a way that Ron had stepped out across the state line. The whole town is really badly shaken up. Nice, quiet place, something like this. Sheriff, let me stop you in the hallway here for just a second. There's a few things that we got to get straight right off the bat. I've learned about this the hard way. It's best to talk about it up front. When the bureau gets called in...
love costumes. It's me, Lloyd. Nothing, I'm just driving around. She broke up with me. What do I do? Can't she come back? How can I get her back? I can't. I can't get her to talk to me. I'm so fucked up. I feel like crying. She gave me a pen. Colleagues find a way to harness this bad ball kind of energy. And I'll just sit back and watch these shit kickers go broke. Howdy, stranger. Thanks. Ça va pas, non? Ça va très bien. Non, ça ne va pas. J'en ai plus envie de partir avec toi. Oui, je le savais. Je ne sais pas. On parlait, je parlais de moi. De toi, de toi. Je trouve que Alors, je suis idiot. Tu aurais dû parler de moi. Et moi, de toi. Je ne veux pas être amoureuse de toi. J'ai téléphoné à la police pour ça. Je suis restée avec toi parce que je voulais être sûre que j'étais amoureuse de toi. Que je n'étais pas amoureuse de toi. Et puisque je suis méchante avec toi, c'est le seul que je ne suis pas amoureuse de toi. Oh, dis-le. Et puisque je suis méchante avec toi. C'est la preuve que je ne suis pas amoureuse de toi.
from the swing line to the Boston stapler, but I kept my swing line stapler because it didn't bind up as much, and, and I kept the staples for the swing line stapler. Okay, Melvin. And, oh, no, it's not okay because if they make me, if they if they take my, my stapler, then I'll, I'll, I'll have to, I'll set the building on fire. Okay, well, that sounds, uh, sounds great. Uh, I'll talk to you later, all right? Bye. Bye. Yeah.